letting him sign books. He will be doing that before his reading. Uh, so 1, 1 1.30, he'll be out at the book table. So if you wanted to get his books and have him sign, please do that before his 2 o'clock session and not after. And then the writing post-trauma workshop this afternoon is open to anybody who's writing post-trauma, not just to vets, but we're very happy and honored to have our veterans with us today. Welcome to all of you. Hey. by Third Street Books and your books can be purchased there. Most of the speakers will be signing books in the half hour or so after their session. So if you're interested in buying books and getting them signed, do that right after that speaker speaks. The raffle baskets, we have five of them on the table out there. Um, tickets are five dollars each and you have a pretty good odds of getting one there with a hundred people here and five baskets. That's good odds, right? Depending on how many raffle tickets you buy, that could be very good odds. And we also have an open mic sign up. Steve, do you know where that sign up is? It's, up, it's on the desk. On the same table. And that's if you'd like to read uh, your work at 4 o'clock or from 4 to 5. We'll just be gathering in here, probably a smallish group to read. That can be work you generated today or work you brought with you today. And if you're feeling a little bit shy and intimidated now, but you get a boost of confidence after your second cup of coffee, you can sign up all day long for that. Yes? Must you be present to win the round? Yes, you must be present to win because you got to take it home again. Yeah. And when do you draw them? When do we draw the raffle? Committee people? I forgot to ask that question. Like right before the second. Okay, right after lunch. Yeah. Right after lunch. All right, speaking of lunch, your lunch and your refreshments here are going to generate some refuse. And this refuse, we're going to try to sort and recycle as much as we can. Unfortunately, you would think your coffee cups are paper and they can compost, but in McMinnville they can't. They do need to go into the trash. However, your tea bags can be composted. So we have um, zero waste here to help us sort through that uh, waste. And McMinnville, zero waste McMinnville has a goal of by the year, I think it's 2024, eliminate 90% of our waste from going into landfill, which is lovely. So we'll contribute to that today, both uh, after this session, after lunch, anything that you need to get rid of. And now I'm going to segue into introducing our speaker. But first I have to mention the Yam Hill Watershed Stewardship Fund, who provided a grant to bring Kathleen Dean Moore here today. Uh, the Yam Hill Watershed Stewardship Fund is a volunteer administrative group, and their mission is to promote knowledge and appreciation of healthy lands, waters, and wildlife in the Yam Hill region. They were happy to be able to help us bring Kathleen here. And we are also a volunteer run, of course, and we're really pleased and grateful to have Kathleen Dean Moore as our morning keynote speaker. Kathleen's most recent title, Great Tide Rising, a nonfiction, is an Oregon Book Award finalist. And I fully expect her first novel, Piano Tide, which was released in December, will be a finalist this time next year. I myself met Kathleen in my hometown of Corvallis, her adult hometown. Uh, I graduated from Oregon State University in 1999, just a couple of years, I believe, before Kathleen became a faculty member there in the philosophy department. Corval I, I went back to Corvallis, you know, my family is and was still there, so thinking like a writer, I like to imagine that Kathleen and I crossed paths, you know, said hello to each other one time walking out to the sheep barns uh, outside of town, or we saw each other in the library, and of course we're very polite and kind to each other as we raced to get our books uh, checked out, or at Fred Meyer, you know, we're squeezing avocados together or whatever. So that's the way my writerly mind works. But actually, more than 20 years after I graduated from, from college, in 2011, my path did cross with Kathleen's in Corvallis at the Public Library. I had the honor of reading with Kathleen and two other Oregon Book Award finalists. In fact, as I was writing up this introduction yesterday, uh, I clicked over to Facebook to check an urgent message which said, Lisa, here's a moment from six years ago you might want to look back on. And it was our poster from that reading, which was April 21st, 2011. So it was six years ago yesterday. I do read Kathleen's work. I had read it before the reading, and I continued reading her work through the years. Uh, she has, I believe, three essay collections, 
the newest book, which is also nonfiction, and her fiction title out there on the book table. I highly recommend them. I have come back to her essays again and again through the years for the, the way they make me draw in my breath at the beauty of the natural world and the way they make me own up to my own mindless consumption of the same. And in Kathleen's work, there's hope, not just to salvage the earth, but to bring restoration. Please welcome Kathleen Dean Moore. Thank you, Lisa. Yeah, I remember squeezing those avocados. <laughs> <laughs> great, great fun. Hi. 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 Happy, happy Earth Day. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, driving up here from Corvallis, it did seem like the Earth was happy today. <laughs> Don't you think? Just imagine if you were a leaf and you would finally, after all winters, just finally spread yourself out. Think how that would feel. <laughs> and the rivers are full, the birds are singing, uh, the vineyards are <laughs> promising us a good, good <laughs> a good party next year. It's going to be great. And I'm happy to be coming into a community of writers. There's nothing I would rather do. You know, um, yeah, most of the time when I'm writing at home, I'm hanging out with my husband. And he's not a writer, he's a fisherman. And the problem with being a fisherman, making making uh, your time as a fisherman, is that every time you succeed, you have to kill something. You bash it on the head, and there's one fewer of those left in the world. But when you're a writer, it's so different. You just lift up your hand, and you lift this word out of the air, and you put it on the page. And the consequence is not fewer words, but more. So we work in the most generous of all possible, I almost said disciplines. We work in the most generous of all possible joys, this business of writing. My title today is um, Medusa's Curse, the work of a writer in a reeling world. And I noticed that they didn't print that in the program. I think that's probably because they were hoping you all would come. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I will try to make this as painless as possible. But let's go back a little way. Let's, let's think about um, how we probably, as, as long as I have known Elisa, I imagine I have known many of you as well. In my first book, River Walking, goes back to 1995. That's 21 or 22 years ago. You could raise a child to drinking age in that. <laughs> and I don't know about you, but I was a baby then. I mean, not really. I was a mouse in the jungle. I was a babe in the woods. I knew nothing. And I got up in front of them. Um, I was invited to the PNBA to read this essay. And I did. I, I, I chose an essay from the book, and I read the first paragraph. I wanted my daughter to lie in the tent, breathing the air that flows from the Willamette River at night, dense with the smell of wet willows and river algae. I wanted her to inhale the smoke of a driftwood fire in air too thick to carry any sound but the rushing of the river and the croak of a heron startled to find itself so far from home. I wanted the chemical smell of the tent to mix with the breath of warm wet wool and flood through her mind until the river ran in her veins and she couldn't help but come home again. That's why on the weekend before my daughter left for school, I made sure that the family went river camping on the Willamette. Mm -hmm. So I read that first paragraph and I was waiting ready for the second paragraph and the people in the audience clapped and I said, well, damn. <laughs> I must be done. <laughs> so I sat down. <laughs> so you were looking at the person who holds the world's record for the shortest reading at the <laughs> I timed it. 58 seconds. <laughs> back then, you know, when you're a nature writer, back then, the most urgent question for me as a nature writer was, what does a nature writer wear? <laughs> my daughter um, took me in hand. <laughs> my daughter often takes me in hand. Um, I'll tell you another story about that. Um, at any rate, uh, she took me in hand and said, let's go shopping. So she picked out all these things in this pile of clothes and I went into the dressing room and I put them on. Gauzy stuff, layered stuff, light colors, scarves, right? You get the picture. And I went out to my husband and I said, do I look like a nature writer? And I looked at me and he said, 
No. <laughs> you look like a roll of toilet paper. <laughs> I was a babe in the woods, and I was in so in love with the world back then, and so were you. But about then, just about then, it became clear that while I was doing all this writing to celebrate the natural world, this glorious world, it was slipping away. And even as I was rejoicing in frog song, as I do, Walmart was bulldozing the pond. And big oil executives, to increase their unimaginable profitable, unimaginable, see I can't even say it, profits, what Bill McKibben calls the, the largest profits in the history of money, were devising business plans that would knowingly take down the great systems that sustain human life on Earth. Knowingly. They knew exactly what they were doing because their own scientists told them 40 years ago. So loving the world became more complicated, and I honestly didn't know what to do. Now, what is the calling of a writer in a real world? And things were dying around me. I was trying to write about them, and things were dying around me. From um, Great Tide Rising, the first, the preface called At Low Tide, Watching the World Go Away. <coughs> We're wading in rubber boots at the rim of the sea, my grandson and I. It's a silver day in Alaska, shining, shivering seas and clouds so low you feel you could bump your head. My grandson leans over to poke a graying starfish. This one is soft. That means it's sick. This child is three years old and already he knows the signs of starfish wasting syndrome. He gives the sea star a last poke with his forefinger and stands to gaze around the cove. His mom is around here someplace, he said, wrinkling his brow and not finding her. He's sick. He needs a mom. I think that is undoubtedly true. Just last year, this cove was full of sea stars. We saw them in every damp crevice, heaps of them. This year, we come across only two or three stars, here and there, splayed on the shingle. These that remain are wasting away, too, a hideous process. Lesions form. The tissues around them decay, so the sea star flattens and falls apart. An arm may crawl away, but soon it too turns to mush. Around our boots, torn arms and the wispy scraps of wasted sea stars float on the incoming tide. It's a catastrophe, among many on a planet growing sour and hot, and I am afraid for this small child. If only there were a mom around here somewhere who could shelter the young lives and comfort us all. But what would such a mother do? I can't think of anything worse for any parents than to feel helpless as pieces of their child's world break off and quietly go away. A statement of scientific consensus led by Stanford scientists has badly shaken me. Unless all nations take immediate action, by the time today's children are middle-aged, the life support systems of the Earth will be irretrievably damaged. I'm holding the hand of a small child in a yellow raincoat and orange bib overalls. His little boots have long ago filled with water. His hair is damp and smells of salt. And I am staring at my boots and thinking of what it could possibly mean to this child to live on a planet whose life-supporting mechanisms have frayed and fallen apart. I don't know what to do. You know, I'm a writer. What, what does the writer do? In the last 50 years, approximately 40% of everything that has the breath of life, plants and animals, has been erased from the face of the earth. 39% of terrestrial wildlife, gone. 39% of marine wildlife, 36% of freshwater wildlife gone in our lifetimes. And the greatest extinctions are in the poor countries. Extinctions at 58% where the wealthy countries are exporting, outsourcing their environmental destruction. And I haven't even begun to talk about climate change, and in fact I won't. 
which is a act of mercy for which you may thank me. <laughs> I don't do that for everybody. <laughs> so for a while it was possible to just not pay attention and focus, as you do often with the camera, on, on the one thing you want to see. And uh, you could imagine that the Earth was spinning along just fine. And you might not notice what's missing from the ecosystems because what's missing does not tell you I'm gone. Uh, the extinct frogs do not pile up around your legs. You can't hear the missing bird song. But now I think it's impossible not to know. The, although Leopold said, the cost of an ecological education is that one lives alone in a world of wounds. And I think that that is right, that all of us now have an ecological education, and we can smell the blood and the feathers that are seeping out from under the parking lot, the new parking lot at that Costco. And you can smell the scorched brakes as we're trying to skid to a stop on this dead-end road. You can hear the crunch of capitalism eating its own feet. You can hear the way, you can hear the, the world cry out in all these messages that are sending us in the languages of fire and storm. And David Orr says, the economic machine that has resulted in a destabilized climate raises the specter that we will make our home uninhabitable to humans and we will take much of the natural world with us. This is a crime against the future, a crime that has yet no name, no judge, no jury just an awful silence. To me, that changes everything. If you actually face that, if you allow yourself to open your heart to it, that changes everything. And it asks you all over again, what is a writer to do in a, a reeling world? So let's begin with Annie Dillon. I don't know about you, I always begin with Annie Dillard. Yes. If I am stuck, I just reach up on my shelf, open to any random paragraph, read it out loud, and I am unstuck. Um, so if you're taking notes, say if you're stuck, Annie Dillard. <laughs> she writes so beautifully, but here's what she said. Write as, this is advice she's giving to writers. Write as if your reader were dying. What would you say to a dying person that would not enrage by its triviality? That's a bit of a high bar, <laughs> a very high bar. But she took it seriously herself, wrote about the biggest questions. What is the meaning of evil? What is the meaning of life? But now we have to write as if the planet were dying, because it is. What would you say? to a planet in the spasm of extinction. We're not writing anymore on the chance of fame or profit. We're writing on the chance of saving a planet that's able to nourish life. What do we do? Well, my friend Robin Kimmerer, do you know Robin Kimmerer? Do you know braiding sweetgrass? Yes. Uh, <laughs> wonderful person, wonderful person. Right down to two braiding sweetgrass. You can tell I've been a professor for way too long. Braiding sweetgrass. Robin Kimmerer. Can you spell that? K-I-M-M-E-R-E-R. -E -E -R. She's a Potawatomi elder and a botanist who specializes in moss. You will love her. So she says, well, if you want to know, this is her heritage, if you want to know what your responsibilities are, ask what are your gifts. The thrush has the gift of a beautiful song, and so its responsibility is to wake the world. The salmon has a gift of beautiful red flesh, and so its work is to feed the people. And so it goes. So we ask ourselves, what are our gifts that we writers have been given? And if we can be clear about that, then we can be clear about what our responsibilities are in return for that set of gifts. So all of you, so brilliant and so beautiful and so gifted, you probably all were identified as a gifted from an early age. What are our gifts? I'd say, one, a voice and a platform to tell the truth. Two, 
a sense of wonder. Three, a heart, a gift of immoderate love and attention, not these days to be taken for granted. And four, a wild, soaring imagination. Do you feel how lucky you are? <coughs> how blessed. So let's, let's go through these. I have a voice and I can tell the truth. I have a voice, I have a platform, and I can tell the truth. And I have to tell you that I am thrilled to read in the New York Times this morning that Jane Hirschfield, our beautiful California poet, is going to be in Washington, D.C. at the Science March reading a poem. And she's in this organization called Poets for Science. And may I read it to you? Yes. I won't the way Jane does. She's such a beautiful woman. But here's what it is. It's called On the Fifth Day. On the fifth day, the scientists who studied the rivers were forbidden to speak or to study the rivers. The scientists who studied the air were told not to speak of the air. And the ones who worked for the farmers were silenced, and the ones who worked for the bees. Someone from deep in the badlands began posting facts. The facts were told not to speak and were taken away. The facts, surprised to be taken, were silent. Now it was only the rivers that spoke of the rivers, and only the wind that spoke of its bees, while the unpausing, factual buds of the fruit trees continued to move toward their fruit. The silence spoke loudly of silence, and the rivers kept speaking of rivers, of boulders and air. Bound to gravity, earless and tongueless, the untested rivers kept speaking. Bus drivers, shelf stockers, cone riders, machinists, accountants, lab techs, cellists kept speaking. They spoke the fifth day of silence. So um, our problem is a problem of silence. Our problem is that you can't hear extinction, and that when it comes to climate change, you can't necessarily see it happening. And statistics, these pollsters tell us, that of the 65% of people who are very or fairly concerned about climate change, more than 80% of them have not said the word climate change in the last week. So we have a face, we're faced with a kind of silence that I think is a serious issue. But we have voices. So because I'm, I'm a literary writer, and I'm writing about climate justice, people often ask me, so what is the importance of the arts in the climate struggle? So I turned to Friedrich Nietzsche, you know, this German philosopher, and I said, I quote him, 19th century German philosopher, Nietzsche. He says, we have art in order not to die of the truth. We have art in order not to die of the truth, he wrote. Well, you know, I'm a philosopher, I ponder that. What does he mean? What are these lethal truths, these truths that break our hearts and sap our spirits and turn us to stone? Well, I think he's thinking about the truth of death, our mortality. But to me, I think that um, our truths that are turning us to stone are these silent catastrophes that we're facing the extinctions, the climate change, the prospect of our children not having a future in this place. <clears throat> so how can art save us in the face of those truths? Here, here's how I see it. You all remember Medusa, right? That monstrous woman in Greek mythology. Um, Medusa was a gorgon, and she had such a terrifying face that no mortal could gaze upon it without dying. This reptilian face, this poisonous hair, dripping snakes. A person who looked directly at her would turn to stone. And see, I think that's the danger. I think that's where we are. That the face of catastrophe that we are encountering, if we look straight at the desperate truths of our time, we're turned to stone. Our hearts are hardened. We're unable to act. Uh, joyless, we become inhumane. We become immobilized. We become me. We freeze into business as usual, as if we had no choice. So, enter the hero Perseus. Perseus, 
who, along with his winged shoes and his magic scythe, carried a beautiful reflective shield. When he held the shield up, he caught Medusa's <coughs> ugly image, and there was Medusa reflected in his shield. She, her image was transformed, but not transformed. It was revealed, but not literally represented. It was revealed. And Perseus, seeing her in an entirely new way, faced her reflection boldly and cut off her head. So what is this reflective shield that can show us the danger without turning us to stone? What can open our hearts without breaking them? What can replace this paralyzing fear with this new vision of what's beautiful and possible? What can break the bonds of lies and denial? What can, and I'm going to quote Jane Hirschfield, what can allow us to see, to sing, to welcome with courage and grace and imagination whatever enters, whatever asks entrance into our lives? And the answer, of course, I submit, is art. Art, our writing is a magic reflective shield. And in a time of the face of the truth, it allows us to see these hard truths without being destroyed by them, but rather lifted by them and hardened <coughs> and encouraged, which means given courage. And these are the voices of writers. This is the genius of the dancers. This is the vision of the artist. All the power of words and story and image that help us escape finally from this catastrophic illusion. Thich Nhat Hanh says, let us summon from every voice the lion's roar. Let us gather like a great rising tide. That's a good idea. Or as one of my philosopher colleagues says, his name is Charles Taylor, and what he wants to say is our real gift the extraordinary thing that we can do is we can put things into words. You think about that. We're putting things into words. Into words. He says it matters to speak clearly of all of this. Articulacy, the ability to put things into words, has a moral point, not just in correcting what may be wrong views, but also in making the force of an ideal that people are already living by more palpable, more vivid for them. And making, by making them more vivid, empowering them to live up to it in a fuller and more integral fashion. So how many of you have had someone say to you, I love what you've written. I mean, I, I could have written it myself because <laughs> I could have written that myself because it's exactly what I've been thinking. But your gift is to put it into words. Thank you for that. Right? That, that, that you can say in your words what people can only inchoately Totally imagine. And this is a gift to people to be able to take their, their feelings and their sensibilities and their broken hearts and their expanding hearts and put them into words. You know Charles Goodrich? Yes. My friend in, in Corvallis? He is pissed as hell. I mean, he honestly. This is called, this is Charles' newest poem. It's called, I'm sorry, we do have students. I shouldn't use bad words. <laughs> That's the thing, you know, about this novel that I wrote. I, my novel is so full of bad words because it said rural Alaska, and though that's the vocabulary. And that's the question I get. It's like, you seem like a nice lady. Hang on with whom? Students. Oh, no, I haven't actually. I had to go find a student to ask him what's the worst thing a student could call another one. You guys know? What is it? You tell me. Oh, you won't tell me. It's dipshit. <laughs> <laughs> no, the students in the front row are saying, no, that's not the worst. He was a kind of gentle young man. He said dipshit. So dipshit is in my novel. You can find and then go research of their dipshit. <laughs> By the way, thank you students for coming and thank you teachers for nourishing what is beautiful and expressive in their lives. At Nesquin on President's Day, dingy green carpet, pink formica countertops, fragrance of mildew and sanitizer. I've always liked this motel. <laughs> and 
what better place than a tsunami doomed beach town at the westernmost edge of the continent on a faux national holiday a month into the speckless administration? From the dinky balcony, I listen to the waves hissing ashore until the maid starts vacuuming the unit next door. Then, in rain bibs and parka with the hood pulled up, I slouch out into the mist. One block over, a big old Sitka spruce has been completely uprooted. Last night's storm has strewn the narrow streets with branches as if some mean and destructive parade has marched through. With the tide coming in and the drizzle thickening to rain, I trudge on wondering, what on earth can be done? March? Send money? Undo the years of gerrymandering? Write poems? Spit in the ocean? <laughs> Now a rainbow congeals from the gunmetal clouds. I watch a tall, shaggy man shooting a video of his tiny daughter as she drags a six-foot-long bull kelp toward the waves. No one can say where this country is headed. The little girl does not know how it works. So I'm going to adopt her brave, innocent attitude toward the future. Dressed in blue fleece, pink tights, and yellow rubber boots, she splashes into the shallows. Dad, she yells. I'm putting it back. And she slings a long, slippery plant back into the surf. That was the first gift, this gift of words. It calls to us, our gifts call us to honor our gifts and, and to return the gift of them in our own work. The next thing is a sense of wonder. And I think that, that writers have this beautiful ability to, to notice things and to be astonished. Um, sometimes I think the most important words that a writer can put on paper are look. Just look. Look at this morning. Look at this child. Look at this hotel. Look at this trailing kilt. Look at this child as if you've never seen any of them before. And then the truth is revealed to us. We can't take this for granted, this fact that there's something rather than nothing, and that it's so beautiful. The, 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 the gift is the gift of radical amazement. So, of course, I call on Mary Oliver. <laughs> it is our nature not only to see that the world is beautiful, but to stand in the dark, under the stars, or at noon in the rainfall of light frenzied, wringing our hands, half mad, saying over and over, what does it mean that the world is beautiful? What does it mean? You know, I have a neighbor at my cabin in Alaska, and she said, you know, have you, you're a philosopher. Have you heard of the problem of unnecessary beauty? <laughs> Have you heard of the problem of unnecessary beauty? It's, um, so if you open up an oyster, the inside of it is unbelievably beautiful. Well, that's not necessary. Nobody ever sees that until it's dead. It has no influence on its, um, what's the word in evolution, on its um, ability to reproduce. It's just there, beautiful and unnecessary. That, she's, that my friend says, and philosophers are saying, it's a problem. <laughs> It's a problem for those who explain everything in the world as a function of um, its adaptive value. Otherwise, it's not a problem. It's good. So, let's illustrate this. I want to, um, oh, goodness. So I want to talk about this incident that happened to us up, up, in, um, up in the lake. And you know, I've told you already, or perhaps I haven't, that my husband is a scientist. He's a self-described hard scientist. And so you should try, see us try to paddle a canoe. You know? <laughs> you've got the philosopher in the bow, you've got the scientist in the stern, and I'm rejoicing in the sounds of the night. And Frank, Frank's explaining the biomechanics of frog song. <laughs> so he says, imagine blowing up a balloon. Now, imagine blowing up a balloon made of your neck skin. <laughs> now, imagine blowing it up twice your size. Now he says, Hold it there and tremble all night long. <laughs> the energetics of this music are so tough, so much energy expended that it could kill a frog. And some tree frogs only have enough energy to sing for three nights. 
three trembling nights. Imagine that. Imagine, he says, the silence of the frogs on day four. <laughs> so I do. I sit there listening to that silence. And then he says, now, imagine swallowing a moth so big that you have to push it down your throat with your eyeballs. <laughs> <laughs> and we look across the lake, and there's the path of the moon that's glittering with the discarded wings of a trillion flying ants. And we look at the moon itself, bulging out between black mountains. We note in passing that we ourselves are sailing at a zillion miles an hour through the darkness, spinning in a spiral galaxy, slung out across space, slung out with all the singing frogs and the quiet ones up to their eyeballs in swamp. And if we even think about our own sparkling minds on that sparkling lake, the molecular structure of awareness, say, the biochemistry of celebration, the universe singing its own praises in the language of philosophy and science, then we have to hold on to keep from swamping the canoe, astonished and shaken. And here's why that matters. Because that profound seeing with our powerful lenses, we writers, our powerful lenses, our profound seeing, this sense of wonder at the endless astonishments, this impulse to honor the sacred world, it has radical moral consequences. It closes the distance between what is and what ought to be. Yeah, we live in this physical world of, of, of rocks and storms, but at the same time, we live in a moral world of hopes and a vision of what ought to be. And the same impulse that says, this is wonderful, is the impulse that says, this must continue. If this is the way the world is, it's extraordinary, it's surprising, it's beautiful, it's mysterious, it is singular, it is contingent, then this is the way I ought to act in that world. With gratitude, yeah. With joy and celebration, with wonder, with caring, with restraint, and with a sense of responsibility to care for. That's wonder. So we get to number three which is a gift of immoderate love. Our, our, our open hearts, our ample love for the world. So I want to read you part of the story. It's in, also in um, Great Tide Rising. <coughs> it's called Ring the Angelus. Its dateline is May 25th, 2025. All those years, the swans and thrushes, swains and thrushes were the first to call in the mornings. Their songs spiraled like mist from the swale to the pink sky. That's when I would take a cup of tea and walk into the meadow. Oh, there was music in the mornings all those years. In the overture to the day, each bird added its call until the morning was an ecstasy of music that faded only when the diesel pumps kicked on to pull water from the stream to the neighbor's big cherry trees. Frogs sang and sang the evenings were glorious. They sang all evening and into the night. They sang while crows flew into the oaks and settled their wings, while garter snakes, their stomachs extended with frogs, crawled finally under the fallen part of the oaks and stretched their legs against cold ground. I don't know how many frogs there were in the pond then. Thousands, tens of thousands, clumps of eggs like eyeballs in aspen. When the eggs hatched, they were tadpoles. I have seen the shallow edge of the pond black with wriggling tadpoles. There were that many, each with a song growing inside it. <clears throat> In the years when the frog choruses began to fade, scientists said it was a fungus. When the bats stopped coming, they said that was a fungus too. When the goldfinches came in pairs, not flocks, we told each other the flocks must be feeding in a neighbor's field. No one could guess where the thrushes had gone. The fields were as empty as the perfect emptiness of a bell, the perfectly shaped absence singing the Angelus, the evening song, the call to forgiveness at the end of the day. The spring when our granddaughter was born, I brought her to the pond so she could feel the comfort I had known there for so many years. Killdeer waddled by the mud by the shore, but even then not so many as before. I held my granddaughter in my arms and sang to her then. An old lullaby that made her soften like wax in a flame, molding her little body to my bones. She fell asleep in my arms, unafraid. 
I will tell you, I was so afraid. Poets warned us, writing of the heartbreaking beauty that will remain when there is no heart to break for it. But what if it's worse than that? What if it's the heartbroken children who remain in a world without beauty? How will they find solace in a world without wild music? How will they thrive without green hills edged with oaks? How will they forgive us for letting frog songs slip away? It isn't enough to love a child and wish you well. It isn't enough to open my heart to a bird-graced morning. Can I claim to love a child if I don't use all the power of my beating heart to preserve a world that nourishes children's joy? Loving is not a kind of la-di-da. Loving is a sacred trust. To love is to affirm the absolute worth of what you love and to pledge your life to its thriving, to protect it fiercely and faithfully for all time. Ring the Angelus for the salmon and the swallows. Ring the bells for frogs floating in bent reeds. Ring the bells for all of us who did not save the songs. Holy Mary, Mother of God, ring the bells for every sacred emptiness. Let them echo in the silence at the end of the day. Forgiveness is too much to ask. I would pray for only this, that our granddaughter would hear again the little lick of music, the grace note toward the end of a Meadowlark song. Meadowlarks. There were meadowlarks. They sang like angels in the morning. Love has a claim on us. This whole notion of ferocious compassion, that's not an oxymoron. This is the kind of compassion that we have that calls us to action. This is the kind of passion we have that gives us hope, because hope is also found in action. Um, so as we, love our, as we write our love stories to the earth, as we write our love stories to our families and friends, we're also calling people to action to protect what we love. And all of us as writers, we have to ask ourselves, what is it that we love too much to lose? That is our agenda. So let's go straight to the gifts of the imagination because our work is to tell a new story. Um, Joanne Macy, the, the marvelous California eco philosopher, Buddhist, priestess, <laughs> points out that we have three possible frames that we can live in. And these are going to sound familiar. We can live in the frame she calls business as usual. That's the story of the industrial growth society. And we hear it from politicians and business schools. We hear it from corporations. I imagine we hear it in the corporate controlled media. And the defining assumption is that there's really no need to change how we live. The central plot is getting ahead. And yes, there are weather extremes. And yes, there are economic recessions and national security challenges. But those are just temporary difficulties from which we will surely recover. And if we are smart, Profit. Now, the second frame she tells us about, she calls the great unraveling. And this is a story we hear from people like me. Um, it calls attention to the disasters that business as usual has created and continues to create. It's a, an account that's, that's based on evidence of the ongoing derangement and collapse of biological and economic and ecological and social systems. Those two. But her point is that there's a third frame. And the third, we don't have to live in the process as usual or the great unraveling. There's a third frame, and it's called the great turn. And that's the story that we hear from those who think that they, 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 they see the great unraveling, but they will not let it have the last word. And so it involves an emergence of this great and creative outpouring of human response that enables a tradition a transition from the industrial growth economy to a life-sustaining society. And the central plot is joining together to act for the sake of the earth. Writing that story is going to be the greatest exercise of the human imagination the world has ever seen. But it's the story that will allow us to make that transition. If you can't imagine it, you can't create it. But if you can imagine it, Sometimes imagining it 
He mentions it into existence. Yet the writers are good. And some of you are really good, beautiful writers who are imagining the end of civilization, the catastrophe, the apocalypse. I propose that the real work, the, the, that the higher work, harder work, it's, all this is real work, but the harder work is to imagine the new civilization, is to imagine that there is not going to be this apocalypse, but a new transformation into something much different. There has to be a better way. And writers are the ones who can imagine that into existence. How will we feed ourselves? How will we educate our children? How will we travel? What will we worship? What will we eat in this new world? And then build a novel on that vision. So what I want to say is that writers may not be able to save the old world. I'm not sure they should. But they can help create the new one. And our dear, dear Ursula Le Guin, right down the road, says it. She says, hard times are coming when we'll be wanting the voices of writers who can see alternatives to how we live now, who can see through our fear-stricken society and its obsessive technologies to other ways of being and even imagine real grounds for hope. We'll need writers who can remember freedom, poets, visionaries, realists of a larger reality. Push the pause button, because that's what I want to say about imagination. I can go on and talk further about imagination and the great transformation or I can move straight to my closing and ask for questions. How many people want questions? Okay. How many people want more of that? Okay, here it comes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to be here all day, which I'm very much looking forward to. I love learning from writers about how to write. And I will be here for lunch. I would love to talk with you individually. So Alex, let's talk. Let's get together. And let's ask your question. So, um, well, what, what I ask myself is, um, where are we going to go with this work? You know, I, I, I stand there, I have a mission statement. You all have a mission statement? You all need to go to the coast and come up with your mission statement. <laughs> Here's my mission statement is, for the sake of the children, I stand against the plunder of the... For the sake of the... You think I could remember my own mission statement. <laughs> for the sake of the children, I stand against the corporate plunder of the planet. And I thought, well, la di da, that's a lovely thing to say, but what does that mean? I mean, how does it happen? How do you do that? At what cost? What people do that? How do you stand up to corporate plunder? Uh, 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 and how do you make your plans? Uh, what do you eat while you're doing it? That kind of thing. And I said, well, that sounds like a novel. And so that's what I said I was going to do. I was going to imagine a situation where um, a, a character has a long history of plunder in this little Alaskan inlet. You know, there's a list of things that he's simply extirpated. You know, first the halibut, and then the salmon, and then the clams, and then the old spruce, and on and on. And now he wants to take the water. He wants to, to dam up a salmon stream, bring in big tankers, <laughs> suck out the water, the glacier water, the glacier milk, ship it to India, where it will be bottled, to be shipped back to California and sold in seven lengths. <laughs> so how do people stand against that? And this is the, the plot line of that novel. Um, <clears throat> is an act of imagining about how these things can be done. Once again, if we can't imagine how are we going to do them. Um, so I'm writing along. I'm only going to read you tiny pieces of this book, but I'm writing along, writing along, and uh, I get a draft. and. I, I put everything in there because I wanted it to be a page turner. I wanted it to be an airplane book. I wanted people to pick it up in the airport and when they get to Chicago, be done and they transform. Um, <laughs> so I thought, I don't know how to write, I don't know how to do this at all. So, you know, my first step, of course, was to go to the library and get a book that says how to write a novel and read that book. And then I read, I wrote it and it was just, oh, one of my best friends read it and said, I don't care if your characters live or die. <laughs> my daughter read it and said, Mom, you really shouldn't try to write about sex. <laughs> I said, 
I better get back to work. And I did. And, and it was seven drafts, but I did finish it. And um, honestly, it's not philosophy on legs. But I, I just want to read you the, 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 the part that's for the end. Um, because in many ways, the conflict is not so much a conflict between people or business plans. The conflict is a conflict between worldviews. These fundamental questions about who we are in the world, a worldview, a paradigm that we live in and swim in, our answers to these three basic questions. What is the nature of the world? What is the world? What is the place of a human being in that world? What is a human in relation to that world? And the third question, how then shall I live? Now we all have questions to those, and those answers to, answers to those questions, and those answers become our world view. Well, we are at this turning point from one paradigm to another. We are um, where the, the, the old world view, the business as usual world view, is clashing up against this other view of us as interconnected beings. Um, and of course there's going to be bullies, of course there's going to be violence, of course there's going to be a great resistance, but the excitement of our time, and what makes up for our being here and having to do all this hard work, is that we probably will live to see a paradigm shift, a sudden avulsion, avulsion, a geographic term for where a river just leaps its banks and goes in a different direction. And here's where I articulate these two paradigms. This is Axel, who is the capitalist, and here's what he says that expresses his. For how good you Good River Harbor people are with your hands, you are surprisingly dim when it comes to business. You can have it all. That's what you don't understand. You can mine the mountains and the seas and the rivers, and the earth will just keep growing more trees, growing more fish. And do any of you think the rain will stop falling? That's the miracle of water. It falls from the sky. It melts from the glaciers. It's yours for the taking world without end. Amen. And that's what my company is doing, taking it, transforming the unused resources of the earth into wealth for everybody. The more money there is, the more money there is to share around. Give Good River products a couple more years, and this channel will be swimming in money. And this was just the beginning, selling the water. If those people were smarter, they could figure out how to sell the goddamn air. This is his wife. After this great act of resistance, this great act of, of creative disruption that disrupts his plans in transformational ways. His wife's name, Rebecca. With the free edge of the bandana, Rebecca swiped the tears as she climbed across the meadow. So here's the greatest mystery. What kind of person would damp salmon from a river? What kind of person would cut the salmon off when they're moving most urgently, stop them just short of home after they have traveled a thousand miles to get there? Who could do that? Who could deny them? Hundreds of fish struggling upstream. How could that ever be right? In what morally corrosive world? Damn a river and salmon will throw their bodies against the dam until their faces are white with torn flesh. Then they will fin slowly in the cold tailwater, stinking and dying like the old men outside the door of the Greyhound station. When Tick turned off the chainsaw, the silence was a holiness she almost remembered. Water flowing onto rock in the stillness of the mountain. The words she wanted to say to Axel tumbled through her mind. We'll come back here when it's over, Axel. You'll sit beside me and never once think about how you could market the meadow. You'll think about how beautiful it is and how strong I am and how blessed you are to be in this place. We'll tell the story of the flood that God sent into the valley to save your soul. We will make love then. It will be awkward, our rubber raincoats squeaking and sticking together. We will laugh and tug at the endless layers. Is there no end to this tugging and pulling you alone? Is there any way to get off a boot but to hop and yank? But then our clothes will be in a pile in the blueberry bushes, and we'll stand naked in our woolen socks. You will stroke my hair away from my cheeks and hold my face in your hands, using your thumbs to wipe the dew from my eyelashes, and you will say, maybe you mumble this into my hair, you will say, we can find a better way, Rebecca. There has to be a better way. And that's what this book is about. So let me just come with 
one, uh, one little summary and one more poem, and then we'll be exactly at time and pain. So what I want to say is that with these gifts, we can come to understand our world, and we can come to understand our work. In a time of lies, we can stand for the truth. In a time of destruction, defend the innocent eagerness of the natural world. In a time of bullies, to demonstrate courage. In a time of cruelty, to teach compassion. And under the threat of sullen stupidity, to let our imagination soar, not to envision the end of civilization, but to set a compass course for its redemption. So of course I'm going to close with Berlin Getty. <laughs> the manifesto to the poets, you know it? Poets, come out of your closets, open your windows, open your doors. You have been holed up too long. The trees are still falling and wheel to the woods no more. No time now for sitting in them as man burns down his own house to roast his pig. No time now for the artist to hide above, beyond, behind the scenes, indifferent, paring his fingernails, refining himself out of existence. Time now to open your mouths with a new open speech. Time now to communicate with all sentient beings. Where are Whitman's wild children? Where the great voices speaking out with a sense of sweetness and sublimity? Where the great new vision, the great world view, the high prophetic song of the immense earth and all that sings in it and our relations to it? Poets, descend to the street of the world once more. Clear your throat and speak up. Poetry is dead. Long live poetry with terrible eyes and buffalo strength. Poetry still falls from the skies into our streets still open. They haven't put up the barricades yet. The streets still alive with faces, lovely men and women still walking there, still lovely creatures everywhere in the eyes of all, the secret of all still buried there. Whitman's wild children still sleeping there awake and walk in the open air. Thank you. but I wanted you to get a good visual on Great Tide Rising. This is the nonfiction uh, essays, right? Essay collection. I'm going to pick up a copy of this. I suspect that these books will sell out, which is not to say leave before I finish my announcements, but um, do you go by the book table and buy the copies you want. Kathleen will be signing. In fact, you can proceed over to the book table if you'd like. She will be signing after this session, but as she said, she's going to be here all day. Completely approachable, wonderful uh, lady and professor. So please do uh, chat with her over lunch or between sessions and have her sign your books. Don't be shy to do that. Here's a copy of the novel. I'm going to be picking up a copy of both of these for both myself and one of my children. There are a couple of other essay collections out there. Um, my favorite one is maybe sold out. There was one copy when I last looked. That's Gold Fast, if anyone wants to jet out and get that one. And then Wild Comfort, uh, which is about finding comfort in nature in times of grief, seasons of grief. Beautiful, beautiful essays. I highly recommend it. I wanted to quickly introduce Caroline O'Brien, who is uh, our cinematographer at the back. Caroline is the producer. <laughs> of a local cable and online access program called Literally Literary. Say that three times fast. You've never heard that one before, right, Caroline? Um, she'll be filming throughout the day. She may ask you for an interview. She would get your permission, you know, before filming you extensively. But this is going to be about an hour and a half program. This will be uh, available at McMinnville Community Media. That's mcm 11 Org, as you see, we have another local here, Stephen Long, local author, also involved in the Terroir Festival Committee. And Steve has a program on cable and online access as well. That's the Writing Life with Stephen W. Long. In fact, tonight at 10 o'clock, his interview with our speaker Sean Davis, who's running the trauma workshop, the trauma writing post-trauma workshop this afternoon. <laughs> Uh, we'll be playing at 10 o'clock tonight. Steve also mentioned that the shows are stored on YouTube. So if you go just to, uh, Google or YouTube, search Stephen W. Long, you'll find a lot of shows about the writing life. A couple of questions before we dismiss. Yes. 
if the books are in danger of being sold out, could you be ordered through the, the table? Sure. Stella will be glad to. I mean, if they're out, just ask her. She'll take your address and you can get them out right now. 10 20. Any other reminders I need to give you? I don't think so. So find your way. Don't rush. Don't stumble. And again, welcome.